in going through some old papers this past week, I came across five questions that had been posed by a person who was not a member of the church. And this was many years ago, probably 40 some odd years ago. But I thought they would serve as a great way to go through our lesson today. And I'm simply calling this lesson, The Church, yours, mine, or Christ's. The first question, and I will read through them all. Number one, isn't it true that the present day Church of Christ was begun in the early 1800s by Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell? The second question is this. Was there any organization of your church from the first to the 18th centuries? The third question, <clears throat> on what basis can your ministers claim that salvation can be obtained only through your denomination? Number four, my religion and belief is based on the belief that God is good and just and that we will be judged on how we live and not on belonging to a particular denomination. The last, the fifth one. A person cannot help believing what he believes, can he? So I will uh, take these questions up in the way that the order that they were set out. Isn't it true that the present day Church of Christ was begun in the early 1800s by Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell? Well, I don't know how many people know much about them and a lot of other people who were preaching the same things. Thomas was Alexander's father. But to get to the question, the present day Church of Christ, as that term, watch it, is defined and used in your New Testament. The present day Church of Christ is the same as the olden day Church of Christ. Again, I remind you, I'm letting the New Testament define the meaning of church of Christ. If it is different, it is not the church of Christ. That church, the one you learn about on the pages of the New Testament, was begun by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, he promised to build his church upon this rock, the confession that Peter had made that Jesus is the Son of God. He said at that time, I will build my church, singular, C-H-U-R-C-H. And please notice that he said, my church, Jesus Christ's church it belongs to him and that's why that it wears his name now i know and you know if you're familiar with the new testament that there is no proper name for the church it is referred to as the body of christ it's referred to as the church of god and so on but we need to understand Romans 16 and verse 16 where Paul said the churches of Christ salute you that any one congregation of God's people is a church of Christ. I don't find too many people who don't want to use that term putting out in front of the church building where they meet or making it public in some way saying this is not a church of Christ. The apostle Paul wrote again in Romans 16, 16 to the church at Rome, the church is Christ, salute you. Let me emphasize that. That's one term the Holy Spirit used in writing the New Testament that describes the proper relationship of the church to its builder, 
to the one who purchased it with his own precious blood, Acts 20 and verse 28, and vice versa. The Campbells and many others were trying to come out of what was commonly accepted, had been for hundreds of years, denominationalism. Which denominationalism would be better described as Protestant denominationalism because they all began by protesting the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church back in the 1500s. And thus it turned into what is known as Protestant denominations. I don't know whether they even know when they refer to themselves today, many of the members of those churches, why they're called Protestants. Because many of them don't protest much of anything. Paul told the elders of the Lord's church in the city of Ephesus in Asia that they were to feed the church of the Lord. Now, the Lord's Christ. So that's another way of saying the church of Christ. Which he purchased with his own blood. Acts 20 verse 28. I've referenced that already. But surely we recognize that the church that he built was worth the purchase price. Now, I don't know of people who believe in Christ as their Savior, and that he shed his blood for the remission of sins, would say that Christ's blood was unnecessary. But if his blood is important, so is the thing that it purchased, and that was the church. That's not an invention of mine or any member of the church of Christ. It is simply that way in the infallible, inspired word of God. Acts 20 and verse 28. Now mark it, that church existed long before the Campbells began to call for people to come back to the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. Because in their day, now over 200 years ago, the denominations would have really nothing to do with one another and they prized their various creeds and handbooks and so forth, confessions of faith, to certainly separate them from other denominations. Much of that has changed now. There's a blurring of things among those churches founded on the commandments and doctrines of men to where there's not much difference in them at all and their own people don't even know much about the peculiarities that make them what they are or at least how they started. Thomas Campbell and his son Alexander along with Martin Warren Stone and a host of others. In fact, those two were advocating the same thing. One is what is now in present-day West Virginia, the Campbells. The other down in Kentucky, Martin Warren Stone, they didn't even know about one another at first. But they found they were preaching the same thing. And the plea was, we have one Bible from God. We have one Lord, Jesus Christ. There's one God to serve. Now, why do we have all these different groups warring in these factions that fight one another. So they began to preach a return to the Bible. Yes, they wanted unity, but unity was not the thing that encompassed everything else and set everything else aside. They knew that if they were to have the unity that Christ prayed for, they would have to have the same rule of faith and practice as the final objective standard for all men to follow. So you have Thomas Campbell actually coining the phrase, we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. That's in complete harmony with the inspired Peter's comment, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And yes, both of these men, especially Alexander, did great work in pointing people of many denominations back to the Bible as authority. People who were religious people in those days, the frontier days of the United States, were much closer to the Bible, and if they had any book in the house, many times it was a King James Version. They learned to read from it, and they read from it regularly. Thus, they were more familiar with it. I think I mentioned to you that in studying history over the years that some have said that if you really want to understand the history of the United States, you need to know the King James Bible. And it's very important to do that, just simply to understand secular history and why men thought and did what they did in many cases, many cases in the 19th century. But they founded no church. 
They did not begin a new religion, and they set forth no new teaching. Their plea was not for any church that was begun by men, but for the church of which everybody in those Bibles they had in their log cabins and whatever could read about. And that only, they didn't want anything else. And if you study about their lives in the first 30 years of the 19th century, you'll see that it was a great struggle for them to come out of a lot of things because it was new to them. New because the churches that were around them spent much time in their particular confessions of faith and creed books. They didn't pay much attention to the Bible except to try to support their creeds. They didn't even make a distinction between the Old and New Testaments as to what is the final source of authority today. Now, that's what I would say about anybody. If the Lord's church was hardly known today, and it tends to get that way more all the time as the nation becomes more material and secular and atheistic, that if we wanted to have what the Lord said he would build in Matthew 6 to 18 that he purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28, and that he did establish Acts chapter 2, then would we go back to the Bible and especially the New Testament to learn about it? If you don't go back to the Bible as the true infallible source book of Christianity, where are you going to go? People say, well, we could go to the so-called Church fathers beginning in the 2nd century, 3rd century, and 4th century. Do you not realize they had the same relationship to the Word of God that we do? They were just closer to the historical times than we are. So we need to look to the source, not to what somebody says about the matter. That's the reason that even to this day, faithful congregations of God's people and faithful preachers of the gospel and all that that means will tell you, even as I do, you need to be studying what I say. You need to be studying the Bible for yourself. You need to know it well enough to check up on things. Those people of that time did that, and that's the reason they came out of human churches. The next question, was there any organization of your church from the 1st to the 18th centuries? Well, first of all, the expression, your church, is an erroneous expression. It's not speaking as the oracles of God, which God says we ought to through the inspired Peter. I don't have a church. I didn't build a church. I didn't die for a church. certainly didn't shed my blood for a church. And I'm not the savior of a church. And I'm not the head of a church. We've already established that the church of which we read in the New Testament has Jesus Christ as its head. It's his. It belongs to him. It troubles me greatly at how easy it is for brethren to fall back into the terminology used by denominational people who are really not anchored in New Testament terminology. I've heard all my life as a preacher, members of the church say, our congregation. Well, you think about that for a minute. Our congregation? Well, if it were truly my church or our church, then let it be called by the church of David Brown, the church if you put your name there. But it's not. It's God's church. And we refer to it according to the scriptures. It's the Lord's church. It's not my church, not your church. It's not our church. It's the Lord's church. And yes, there was organization from the 1st to the 18th century. You'll remember that when Jesus gave the parable of the sower of the soils, He likened it to the kingdom, kingdom of Christ, which is another term for the Lord's church. The kingdom of Christ is the church of Christ and vice versa. 
He even used those terms interchangeably when he promised to build his church in Matthew 16. But Luke 8 and verse 11 plainly says, the seed is the word of God. Now that's a statement and it makes a claim. The seed is the word of God. The seed of the kingdom is what he's talking about. It's the word of God. And the organization of the church is not found in men. The practices of men, nor the teachings of men. It's found in in the seat of the kingdom, which is the word of God. Now here's what the inspired apostle Peter wrote along those lines in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. He says to Christians of the first century in writing part of the New Testament, having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth. Then he goes on to say, but the word of the Lord abideth forever. And this is the word of the gospel, which was preached unto you. And of course the Lord had commanded and does command the church to preach the gospel. It's God's power to save, Romans 1.16. Now there's only one power of God to save us from sin. He could have chosen the way he wanted to, but he chose this. And that's the gospel of Christ. And as long as that word endures, the church and all that it has to teach about the church, including her organization, will endure. And that word abides forever. So the seed of the kingdom's here. You want to know about salvation that Christ brings that he is the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the father but by him John 14 6 you have your Bible and specifically the New Testament you have the terms of pardon that the Savior gives to us and Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him if you don't intend to obey him you're not going to heaven but I don't know what he wants me to do to be saved if I don't know my Bible. But now here's the third one. On what basis can your ministers claim that salvation can be obtained only through your denomination? Well, again, let me state that your ministers and your denomination are terrible and egregious mistakes. Such is not speaking as the oracles of God. It is a shame and disgrace that after all these hundreds of years that people cannot view Christianity except in the denominational concept. That there are many different churches believing different things, worshiping different ways, different terms of entrance, but yet we're all one. You cannot find that concept in your New Testament. It's simply not there. Now, men came up with it trying to justify denominationalism, but it's not in the Bible. Such terminology suggests that uh, I or somebody owned them, that I chose them or somebody did, or that I run them or ruled them. None of that's true. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. It doesn't belong to you, and it doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to any man. And further, I deny it with all the power within me that the church of Christ, I say again as that term is defined and used in your own New Testament, is not a denomination. The idea of denomination is they're all parts of a whole. But Jesus built the one church. It is the whole. And Acts 2 makes it very clear that on that day the church began when believers cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? He took them as believers and said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then it will tell you in verse 41, that's verse 38, that then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then in verse 47 you find out the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. 
Is it possible to be a member of that church? I'll tell you this, if it is impossible to be a member of that church, I don't want to be a member of any other church because that church is the only one revealed on the pages of your own New Testament. If you have a genuine translation in English, and I seriously doubt anybody here is reading it in Greek, but if you read it in Greek as well as Paul read and understood and wrote it in Greek, it'll teach the same thing. There's one church. Christ built that one church. It's his church. It started on the day of Pentecost. Those who were saved were added to it, and there's not anybody outside of it. But people get hemmed in by man-made concepts of the church, and thus they think denominationally. I would that every denomination cease to exist and only the Lord's church exist. So Christ didn't build a denomination, but he did build his church and he purchased it with his own blood. Every denomination has been built by man based upon the commandments and doctrines of man. And it brings about the division that is characteristic of denominationalism today and has been for a long, long time. Christ deplored this kind of division among those who believe in him as the Son of God. One of the pleas of those in the early 19th century who wanted to see the church exist on earth as it does in the New Testament made it very clear we all worship the same God. We all have and acknowledge the same Savior, Jesus Christ. We all have the same Bible why is it that we're divided? A little common reasoning will tell you something must be put in or injected into what we believe that's different from and contrary to what the Bible all by itself teaches. And thus they begin to return to the Bible as the first move to all be one. Matthew 12, 25, Jesus made it clear every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Well, I believe that principle still to be true. And if you want to know one reason, I firmly believe it's one of the basic root reasons in this nation that there are so many atheists, materialistic people, and more and more people cease to have anything to do with any kind of church or God or Christ or the Bible is because of denominationalism. Now, we can talk about all sorts of other stuff, but if you've got a bunch of people out here saying, oh, yes, Jesus, we love him, he's our Savior, and the Bible's the Word of God, but you believe what you want to, and just so you're sincere, everybody go to heaven. Okay, where does that come from the Bible? Well, if that's true regarding religious matters, what about Morality. Can't the homosexual say, just so you're sincere, it's okay? Just so you're sincere, a man may represent himself as a woman, and so on down the line. Oh, no, no, we can't have that. Well, you have it over here on matters religious. Doesn't make any difference what we believe, just so we're sincere. Well, how do you limit that then just to religious matters? and not allow it for those that want to live every kind of immoral lifestyle they want to that's contrary to what the New Testament teaches. Thus, the groundwork's laid. You sell people this bill of goods that doesn't make any difference what you believe just so you're sincere, and it doesn't just stop with a matter of how you're saved from your sins or the church, its organization, work, and worship. It can also go over to the matter of morality. So people have helped create, denominational people have helped create an attitude of it's all right to do these various things that are immoral. In John 17, 20 through 21, our Lord said, neither for these only, speaking of the apostles, do I pray, but for them also that believe on me through thy word. Now that's you and me that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. 
Now, what I said a moment ago about one of the root reasons immorality and secularism has grown is because of the idea of just be sincere. It doesn't make any what you believe. Just be sincere in believing. Well, obviously, when you see the Lord praying this to the Father on the night before he was to be crucified the next day, something's not right. You look at all these denominations round about. Are they one even as God, the Father, and Christ are one? Well, it doesn't take a... Einstein to see that's not the case. How is that unity? How is it oneness? How is it togetherness? How is it fellowship one with another as the Bible teaches it? Think of the oneness that existed between the Son and the Father. Our Lord said in this prayer that he wanted that to be the same among those who believed on him through the apostles' word. And we do if we believe on him at all. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So that unity will work only because people are adhering to a rightly divided New Testament. Therefore, Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Lord never built one single solitary denomination. let alone 300 or 1,000 or 5,000, however many there might be. I do know that the Bible says that he's the head of one body, which is the church. You read Ephesians 4 and verse 4, and Paul said the church at Ephesus, there is one body. Well, is there? But he not only tells us, there's one body. He tells us in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that body is the church. He does the same thing, Colossians 1, verse 18. We'll just take him at his word. It's going to judge you someday anyway. John 12, 48. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. These words are going to mean and say the same thing on the last day in the dead judgment as they do right now and how since they were revealed back in the first century. Why do we say salvation is in the church? Well, now let's go back to Acts 2. Remember the Lord promised in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Well, you come over to Acts 2 and you've got the church beginning. How do I know? Well, first of all, I can read my own mother tongue, and it's been uh, put into English from those who translated the Greek that the Holy Spirit gave Luke to write. And those people were pricked in their heart by the gospel that was preached to them. They were devout Jews, the Bible says, thus they came there thinking they're pleasing to God. But now they find out They've taken, as Peter said, and with wicked hands, hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. They heard all those proofs and saw the miracles that were done that day. And the scripture says in verse 37, they were pricked in their heart and cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, the denominations say nothing. If you try to do anything today, you're trying to earn salvation. The scripture says that they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter and the other apostles didn't rebuke them for asking that important question. Well, they're believers, and they're told, as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Well, the promise is unto you and to your children and all of them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And you go on through the scriptures, and lo and behold, we come down to 41 and 42. And those that gladly received his word were baptized. And notice the Lord added them to the church, verse 42 and 47. Where are Christians? In that church Jesus built that he purchased with his blood. How did the blood cleanse them? Romans 6, 3 and 4 says we were baptized into the death of Christ. Well, it was in his death where he shed his blood. And the blood was applied to us, if you please, cleaning our souls when we're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Romans 6, 3 and 4, and also verses 17 and 18. Well, that's simple and plain. Why won't men accept it? 
they're too oriented to what they like. And when what they like goes contrary to what the Lord likes, all too often they select what they like because that's where we are. Just be sincere. It doesn't make any difference what you believe. We're living in an age where doctrine doesn't amount to anything with a great many people, even some in the church. They think they can bend and move any way they want to to suit themselves. Well, that's not true on matters pertaining to our salvation and being faithful as Christians. God, through his authoritative word, has told us there are things that must be done. They're obligatory. And that we must believe. So there were 3,000 souls added to the church on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ there in Jerusalem. And that's where he puts everybody that believes and obeys the gospel today and are baptized into Christ. Again, in Ephesians 5.23, Christ is called the Savior of the body. I've already pointed out to you, he defines body to be the church, Ephesians 1.22 and 23. Now, I'll hasten to say quickly, it's not the church that saves. Now, do we all understand that? The New Testament does not teach that the church saves. But it says Christ is the Savior of and those he saves, he adds to what? To the church. Well, 1 Timothy 3.15 says the church is the house of God. It's God's family. Listen to me. God doesn't have any children outside of his family. Now, men may and do. But God's not an adulterer. The seed of the kingdom sown in the mind of honest men, Luke 8, 15. When it germinates, people are born, John 3, 3 and 5, into the kingdom of Christ by water and the Spirit. The Lord adds them to his church. Even his parents, when they have children, add those children to their family. Why, there's not a child anywhere that chose to be a member of the family. How many of you chose to be a member of the family you were born into? Even adopted children, same thing. We're born into the kingdom, the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. God's our father and Jesus is our elder brother who's head of the church. He's blazed the trail for us. As Peter said he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps. That has to do with suffering for the cause of Christ as well as living according to his authority. So how can a person be saved by Christ and be outside the church or in, as a saved person, a human church? There's no salvation in any denomination. No church begun by man can offer salvation. But Christ is the Savior of the church the inspired Apostle Paul wrote that exactly in Ephesians 5 and verse 23. Now, it may upset folks, but you'll just have to be upset. If you'll settle down and use the brain God gave you and be honest and study the revealed mind of God and the words of the Bible and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then you'll come to a proper understanding. The last one is, uh, or next to the last one, the fourth one, is my religion and beliefs based on the belief that God is good and just and that we will be judged on how we live and not on belonging to a particular denomination. Well, I agree with that. God is good and just. And we will be judged, as I quoted earlier from John 12, 48, we will be judged regarding how we live. But belonging to a denomination will not help us please God. That's being involved in something he never authorized, his son never built. So I steadfastly refuse to be a part of any denomination, encourage all of them to cease and desist, plead with everybody that believes in Christ to unite upon the authority of the New Testament as the early church did. It would be a great advance for the cause of Christ. And I don't mind saying this, if all denominations were done away. Christ prayed for that, and I'm going to preach it. I do my best to live it and oppose anything contrary thereto. I have no choice. Someday I'll meet my Savior. You realize that, don't you? Each one of us is going to meet the one 
who built the church, the one who shed his blood to purchase the church, the one who is the head of the church, and he's going to judge us. Now, you want to try to get a denomination to work in the place of the church he built and purchased with his blood? Jesus showed that acceptance of him as the Lord involved doing what he said and the way he said it for the reason he said it. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. I think that language is simple and clear. If we would have salvation, it must be on his terms and nobody else's. By acknowledging that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. By accepting his sacrifice for our sins. By obeying his will. But when we do that from the heart, we will be members of his church and not a denomination. Doing just what he says will not make one a member of a denomination. It will make one a member of the church he purchased with his blood, his church, the one he's head of, the one where he puts all of those he saves when they obey the gospel. Now that's the church of Christ. No more, no less. The church that is of Christ, the salvation of men, and to the glory of God. Those who have put their trust in Christ, those who obey him and are cleansed by his blood in so doing. And thereby they're added by the Lord himself to the church that he built and purchased with his blood. Now really, since the church is the bride of Christ and is therefore one with Christ, according to Paul in Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, how could anyone accept Christ? Really accept Christ as Savior and the Son of God without accepting his church. Why would anyone want to accept the Christ and not accept the church he built that you can read about in your own New Testament? How can one be a part of Christ without being a part of his spiritual body, which is the church, the family of God? And then the last point, a person cannot help believing what he believes, can he? Yes, he can. You read through the prophets and the Old Testament and they rejected the truth of God many times. Others accepted it. You come to Jesus' time, people believed in him, people rejected him. Those who should have believed in him murdered him. So yes, we can believe and we must believe what the Bible says. Jesus said to the Jews of his day in John 8, 24, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Listen, has that changed? One time years ago over Singapore, we were preaching with a cab driver and he found out we were Christians, whatever he knew about that. And he began to talk, well, it doesn't make any difference a whole lot what we believe and all that stuff. I said, well, what do you think about this? Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say a word. Because I know what that means, and he did too. You can't be saved any other way than by Christ, and by Christ's way. So when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we accept what he says, we believe it. Not a matter of choosing what we want, it's a matter of choosing what Christ wants. I don't know how to save myself, you don't either. You don't even know how to save me left alone. You can't even tell me how to be saved without proper knowledge of the scriptures. And I can't tell you. So we must show one another from the Bible what to do to be saved. When Jesus sent out the apostles after his resurrection from the dead, he told them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 through 16. And thus there are no Christians where the word of God, the gospel, has not gone. As we bring this lesson to a close, can't you see that all you need is your Bible to understand the way of salvation? 
that you cannot be saved outside of the church that Jesus built, that he's the head of, that he purchased with his own precious blood, that you cannot be saved without submitting to his will from the heart, and that it all reads the same way today as it did then and will at the day of judgment and mean the exact same thing. There won't be any dodging on that day. Somebody says, well, I just won't come to the day of judgment. Well, if you're of that simple-mindedness, I guess they can poke you in through the fool's hole into heaven because that's the only way you're going to get there. We know better than that. If we'll be honest, in our daily dealings with our livelihood and in the home, we've got more sense than that. We just don't want to use it. It's our will getting in our way of doing the Lord's will. And thus we're going to have it our way. And some way or another we persuaded ourselves, deceived ourselves, and thinking, Lord said, that's all right. That's all right. I'll take you in anyway. You know why we're that way? Because we live in a permissive society. It's a part of the very fabric of where we live. If I push hard enough for what I want, I'll some way get it. It won't work with the Lord. His will is just what the word of God that you have in your hands says it is, no more, no less. And that's what we'll meet at the judgment. If you're not a child of God, we've studied today what to do to become one, become a member of his church. As a child of God, if you've sinned, the second law of pardon is that you repent of those sins, confess them, and pray to God for forgiveness. This song of invitations to encourage you to obey the truth if you need to. Thus, we ask you to come if you need while we stand and sing.